EdTech Live is sponsored by LiveKiosk.com, the $49 solution which turns used computers into no-maintenance web stations for classrooms and libraries. LiveKiosk.com. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon. It's Tuesday, September 26th, and this is EdTech Live, and my guest today is John Hall. John, do you like to be called John? No, the only person that still calls me John is my mother. Everybody else in the world calls me Mad Dog. I can't seem to get Mom to call me Mad Dog for some reason. I don't understand that. So do you really prefer to be called Mad Dog? Sure, because you're walking down the street and somebody yells out, John, you know, lots of people turn around. And when they call out Mad Dog, you're, you're fairly certain that you're probably the only person that they're talking to. Okay, Mad Dog. But where does the name come from? It came from when I was teaching back at a small two-year technical college in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I didn't have as much control over my temper as I do now, and at the age of 27, I was uh, a little angrier, perhaps, or uh, less in control of my temper, and from time to time, the discussions would get a little heated with the Dean of Instruction, who was British, and so... The, sometimes the conversations were too hot for mad dogs and Englishmen. And since he was English, I was the mad dog. Very funny. Well, can you tell me a little bit about your background in history, um, what you're currently doing, and your association with uh, Linux and free and open source software? Okay, well, my, com my association with free software actually starts back in 1969. I was a student at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And back in those days, a single C compiler, for instance, if there was such a thing, a single compiler for any language, might cost in the neighborhood of 100,000 US dollars. And that was when 100,000 US dollars was a lot of money. Uh, my parents had bought a three bedroom home uh, a few years before for about $29,000. So you can see that the development of compilers was very expensive, and software in general is very expensive. And as a student, I needed to get software for the computers I was working on, and I found out about an organization called DECUS, the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society, and they had a catalog of software which people would contribute uh, to the DECUS library, and then people could get it just for the cost of copying it onto some piece of media. That's how I actually got started in free software because I recognized that these people were writing this software because they needed it for their own needs and they were hoping that other people might help them improve it. I was grateful, obviously, for the chance to get this software and this kind of influenced my life as I went through. When I graduated from Drexel, I went to Aetna Life and Casualty, a large insurance company where I was working on IBM mainframes. And there, too, I was exposed to a lot of the source code for the operating system, for databases of different types. And I found out that it was a lot easier to work on the software where I had the source code because I could see what it would do and we could fix the problems right away. Um, after that, I went to Hartford State Technical College and taught there for about three and a half years full time. And it was there that I began to really miss the free software that I had been used to because uh, things were changing in the computer field and people were moving more and more into binary only software. Uh, after that, I went to Digital Equipment Corporation and worked in their Unix group for about 16 years. And while I was doing that, uh, one of the projects I worked on was a thing called Good Stuff, which was a uh, compilation of software that was from the Free Software Foundation and other places. And we compiled it and put it on a CD for our customers so that it would make it easier for them to use it. And then we would basically give these CDs out and I found it interesting that a lot of my managers there at digital just did not understand why people wanted the software instead of the very well engineered software that we produced 
And I kept trying to tell them, well, they want this software because they want the same software on all of their different systems, whether they came from Sun Microsystems, whether they came from IBM or whatever. That's what they wanted. And plus the fact that the software was high quality. And it was at that time frame where I met Linus Torvalds in May of 1994. And I saw Linux for the first time. And by that time, I had worked on a variety of different operating systems. I'd worked on System 3. Oh, I, left out, I left out something. I'm sorry. Before, After I went to the university and before I went to uh, digital, I worked at Bell Labs for about three and a half years. And that's where I learned Unix. And because of that knowledge of Unix and working again with the source code of the operating system and the source code of all the utilities and things, I then went on to digital to work in their Unix group. And all of this exposure to, and re-exposure to the having of source code. And when I finally got to meet Linus and use Linux for the first time, I saw an operating system that was a very good implementation of Unix in the fact that everything seemed to be in the right place and it was very responsive on even some of the smallest of PCs at that time. And I was also very curious about this young man who had done all this and started this project at a very young age. And I became good friends with him. And we talked about putting it to an alpha system because I wanted to see Linux used to do research in using very large address spaces. And some of the things that you could do when all of a sudden your memory space is almost limitless. And then I got involved with Linux more and more, and I got involved with Linux International and became the executive director of that. At that time, Linux International was a vendor organization because there were some small vendors who said, we need to be able to uh, push free software, we need to advocate it, uh, we need to be able to uh, show people how they can make money with it or save money with it. And we feel it's better to do this as an association than do it individually. And so I took over the reins of Linux International from a man named Alan Fetter. Um, I should also uh, point out that a person by the name of Patrick de Cruz first came up with the idea for it. Patrick was in Australia. And we had a small number of, of companies join, mostly small companies, until it grew to about the number of 60 at its height. And then for various reasons, Linux International, um, as, a, as a marketing organization, kind of lost its ability to do that. And now we're in the process of reinventing it as an end user organization not to duplicate anything that anybody is doing already, but to try and do things in addition for the Linux and free software community that aren't being done. So that's a little bit about me and, and Linux International. And I've been a programmer, I've been a systems administrator, educator, a product manager, a technical marketing manager and a bunch of other things along the way, including one time a beekeeper and door-to-door uh, -door salesman. So that's that's me. What's interesting to me about your description of your background is that there does seem to be such a good connection with um, the academic world and and certainly the, the kinds of sharing that take place in an academic environment seem to largely influence the free software movement. And I do notice that you call it free software and and not open source. Is that a matter of choice for you? I can understand some of the reasons and rationale behind calling it open source. And I understand some of the issues that we have in the English language about calling it free software. I object to the fact that people think that they should be able to get the software for no cost at all. Um, 
I, I, I tell people that there's always a cost to things, that the only thing that comes without cost is a mother's love, or maybe the love of God. But I think that we, we missed a point, and, I, and, I, and over the years I had to agree with Richard Stallman in the fact we have to keep stressing that the most important part of the software is the freedom that you have. And maybe we made a mistake in just not keep pressing that concept and educating people in that concept and forcing them to understand that the word free stood for freedom and not free beer. And so that's why I will sometimes call it free and open source software and sometimes I'll call it free software. But I'm tending to move away from the concept of just calling it open source because I, I want people to understand it's the freedom that you have. And sometimes I go so far as to go the opposite and talk about software slavery. The slavery that people have when they use closed source software, proprietary software. Because I can point out the fact that slaves were people that were told where to go and what to do. They had no decision that they could make for themselves. They had no freedom whatsoever. And for some reason in our society, we understand the concept of slavery much better than we understand the concept of freedom. And you know, this is something I continue to try and press. And so that's, that's why I call it free software. Well, I think that concept uh, resonates with a lot of people. One of the things that I find interesting promoting open, free and open source software to the school environment is that a lot of the people who are involved in education are are fairly tapped out. They're very busy. They're asked to, to accomplish a lot of things in their lives, and, um, and, and many of them are actually in the classroom, and they're working with students, and they have uh, a lot of expectations to get a lot of things done. And for them, oftentimes, just the, the, the need for a software program to work and to accomplish what they needed to do becomes an overriding factor. So let's talk a little bit about the the value of that freedom in an academic environment, because I think it may be sometimes hard to fully uh, comprehend that or spend time thinking about it when there's so many other pressing demands. Well, there's a whole series of things, and I think that part of the issue, too, is what people f are familiar with. Um, I think that if we were starting from scratch where there were no computers in school and there was a choice between free software as it exists today and proprietary software, that you'd see much more of the free software being used because people would be used to it. And I think a lot of the professor, a lot of the teachers in schools today, they come in and they see they have the students who have been using uh, proprietary software at home, you know, for their, for their parents' computers, or their parents' computers have proprietary software at home. And like you say, they're busy. They see an uh, uh, easier path going down the proprietary route. On the other hand, we can keep going that path forever, and we run into problems with it. Uh, the problems, for example, in, in Oregon a couple years back where I heard that one school district had to lay off uh, five or six teachers because they had miscalculated on what the upgrade prices would be for the software that they needed for their school system. And that meant that there were you know six or seven teachers laid off. I mean, in my own town of Nashua, New Hampshire this past year, we had a crisis where there was a possibility of having 15 or 20 teachers laid off. And if we could have cut the money of having them laid off by utilizing free software, then we would have been able to uh, avoid that problem. The, but the, I don't want to harp too much even on the cost of, of the software as much as I want to say, talk about the advantages of using free software. 
because when you use free software, you can teach the students two or three times, not just once. If you use proprietary software, you teach the students how to use the software to solve a problem. But the students don't get to see how the software itself solves that problem. With free software, the students could open up the software and look at it and look at the algorithms they use to solve the particular problem and see how that's actually done. And so that's the second way of using free software to teach students. The third way of using free software to teach students is to actually get the students to change the software to meet their needs or to meet the needs of the school or maybe meet the needs of students in another curriculum. And so if particularly if you're in one of the higher grade schools like a junior high or a senior high where the students have probably been or some of them have probably been programming for a couple of years at that point you could interest some of those students in working with the software and working with the software community and changing the software to help you do projects that you weren't able to do before or you weren't able to afford before. And so I would really like to see people think about those concepts in education and even in, in the grades. I ran into people, I ran into a man just the other day at Suhikin High School, very close to me, and he was a technical guy. I happened to stop by and hand out some discs for Software Freedom Day, and he was talking to me about all these computers he had that he couldn't do anything with because they weren't uh, fast enough or big enough memory to run some of the latest proprietary software he had. and. He was very happy that I dropped off these uh, Linux disks because he might be able to use them to set up a Linux terminal server project uh, lab where he could allow these computers to become useful again. So a lot of this is, is not just, and I understand how busy teachers are, believe me, I understand that. But at the same time, maybe they should do something like allow a few computers to be set aside and allow the students to go in and do their experimentation. Allow the students to practice with it. And it may take very little time out of the teacher to get to do this stuff and set this stuff up. But the students might actually learn quite a bit from that. I was down in Curitiba, Brazil, and there was a high school down there where this, they had no money for computer lab whatsoever, absolutely zero money. And they weren't going to get any from the government. And so the teacher went out to industry, got a whole bunch of computers that were donated to them. He, made, he had the students take the computers apart, put the parts on the shelf, and then reassemble the parts into useful systems you know, by consolidating memory and disks and things like that. And then they built an entire computer lab out of that with free software. And the pride, the look of pride on the students' faces as they stood there in their lab, not the school's lab, not the, not the politician's lab, but their lab, while you know, the teachers sat there and, and, and told them how proud they should be of themselves, was just fantastic. And... You know, this is the type of thing you can do when you're in complete control of the hardware and the software so that you can make each work with the other. So it seems to me that it might be worthwhile to make a distinction here between the use of computers in um, a non-technical classroom and the use of computers or the building of a lab or the learning of computer skills in a computer training program because certainly from the perspective of the teacher who's teaching English or um, social studies or regular uh, core academic programs from their standpoint the, the computer is something that gets integrated into what they're doing and and probably the decision making about those computers takes place at the district level or um, at the school level from a technical side. Whereas in the computer 
training area or the computer lab, you may have somebody who has more time to actually focus on, you know, what what could we do here to actually use open source software to to build the lab or to teach about computers. Does that distinction is that distinction helpful? Yes, it is. Um, when we talk about free software, we should also talk about free software that runs on top of proprietary systems, for instance. Um, I was recently at a small school in South Africa where they were teaching photography. And they were using Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, to teach the students how to manipulate the images that they had taken in their photography. And I said, well, that's okay for the school because you purchased a copy of Adobe Photoshop or you got it at a really good discount for yourself. But when the students go back to their homes, they can't afford $600 for a copy of Photoshop. And consequently, they have to pirate the software in order to be able to use it at home. And in effect, you're encouraging these students to pirate software. So I gave them a copy of GIMP, which is a free software tool that works on top of Windows and on top of Linux and on top of BSD and on top of a variety of other systems. And I gave them a book on how to use it. And I sat down with them and, you know, went through a couple of, of elementary stuff with it to show them, yes, it worked. And I left them alone. And about a month later, I sent some email to them, and I said, how are you doing? And he says, oh, the GIMP is drugs, man. It's drugs. Now, I was kind of taken back by that, but then all of a sudden I realized this was meant the GIMP was good. <laughs> that he liked it so much that, you know, he was comparing it to, to the high that some people get from taking drugs. And... You know, it's a little bit of not simply not being exposed, but also the fact that you have to balance these things that you have. Of what are you going to be teaching these students? Are you going to be teaching them that it's okay to steal software? That it's okay because then when do you stop? Do you stop at stealing bikes? Do you stop at stealing cars? You know, do you stop at stealing somebody's wife? You know, what is moral here? And in this particular case, it was moral for them to use free software that's given to them so that they can still do the same things, but they don't have to worry about the fact that they have to pay $600 or something to a company when they can't afford it. So I realize that in the United States, we don't have as much of a problem in that in many areas. However, we do have a problem in lots of areas. And whether that be inner city Chicago, or whether that be American Indian reservations, or whether that be Nashua, New Hampshire, we have that problem. And that's another thing we have to balance. Well, so let's focus on that just for a minute. Because I think there's there's something of real significance there. And, and the story that I often will tell is um, and listeners are probably tired of hearing me talk about this, but Apache is a free software program that uh, operates some or serves up some 70% of the world's websites, and yet it seems that it's virtually untaught in schools. However, teaching Apache and PHP and MySQL and other and Python and other free software programs would seem to give a student a huge um, opportunity to have learned software that's very much in use in the real world, um, you know, a great opportunity for, for actual job training, and that wouldn't cost them anything to, to run and could run on an older computer. So how do we help promote that in the technical training that takes place in schools? because there's no marketing money behind it to, to fight against commercial software, which does get promoted very actively for those purposes. 
Well, I think part of it is just making people really take a look at what's going on. Um, in, in many, many large companies, you do not find a homogeneous set of computer systems. You find a mixture of different types of computer systems. There'll be some people using proprietary software of different types, whether it be from Microsoft or, or whether it be from some large commercial Unix vendor. There'll be people who will be have Linux in there. There will be people who have Apple computers. And if you're teaching people how you know computer science and systems administration and preparing them for that type of a job, you really need to understand that they can't just learn one operating system. They really need to learn everything, or as much about everything as possible, or as generic a form as possible, so that they can apply whatever they've learned to the next operating system they come across. When I, I, I was in Unix systems for many years, I worked on many different types of proprietary operating systems. But when I first started to really focus on Linux, the thing that really made it difficult for me was not the operating system itself, but the terms that the PC people used for their hardware, where it was a specific term from a specific vendor instead of a more generic term from you know, the, the, the greater operating system world. And once I became used to those terms, then the whole thing fell into place for me. So when, one of the things I, I want to tell people that when they start talking about computer science, and some people say, well, Java is the only language you need, I just cringe because Java does not let you go down to see how the machine actually works and how the hardware actually works. It stays at a level above that. And for a lot of things, Java is a perfectly good language. But for certain things, you need a language which allows you to go down and get closer to the hardware. And without people having that understanding, that basic understanding of computer science, it makes it very difficult for them to learn new things that come out because they can't, in their mind, see how they work. Now, going back up a level to your, your problem of the person who's teaching, say, English, and what should they be looking at with free software? Well, there's the Gutenberg project, for instance, where there's, I think, 17,000 uh, license or uh, out of copyright documents that have been accumulated by the Gutenberg project that you could put on a computer system and have access to them without having to spend lots of money for books or anything like that. You can search them electronically. You can, you know, people trying to teach English as a second language would certainly benefit from this because the distribution includes things like you know, Constitution, you know, you know, Declaration of Independence, the Magna Carta, and lots of different documents down through the years, which would be useful. Um, in effect, this is a free software project. It's a, it's a collaborative, creative project that people benefit off of what has gone before. And the Creative Commons links into this also. The fact that you know, as, as, as Lawrence Lessig says, we want to go from being a consumer-only type of, of, of group where we read things and we, you know, we, we absorb things or we, or we don't absorb things. We sit in front of TV mindlessly, right? But we into a creative type of group who creates things and a lot of things based upon what other people have gone before. So you, you bring this into your education also. And then free software starts to flow from this. People who want to teach music, for instance, there's a lot of electronic music out there and there's a lot of very good programs which help you edit that music or uh, create that music, MIDI types of stuff. But again, you can either just use the software or with free software, you can see how the software works. 
What is the combination of mathematics and physics that goes into making these software programs actually work? And that's something that you need to be able to look beneath the covers to see. So maybe, maybe math teachers and physics teachers should take the, the opportunity to, to say to their students, hey, you really like music? You got those little earbuds stuck in your ears? Well, this is what makes it. The mathematics and the physics, right? And all of a sudden, these kids who are really into music get this worried look on their face because, oh my God, he's right. I got to learn more math. I got to learn more physics. So we need to think about all of these things together. And I think you know, part of this, where, where the teachers are really working hard and they're overloaded, we have to come back as a society and we have to say, okay, we have to pay a little bit more. We have to unload these teachers. We have to allow them to have more teachers who can handle this stuff, who could do this, and make the trade-off in my book between paying for proprietary software licenses and paying for the staff that could help the teachers implement this free software and get them to the point where they're using a better product to teach the students. So it's certainly, there's a danger of oversimplifying when in looking at these circumstances, or maybe overgeneralizing. But I, I think a lot of what you've said has made sense. It makes sense to me, and and uh, and I feel like I, you know, I end up um, communicating a lot of the same things to people when I'm talking about free and open source software. Uh, where I have, if we can separate out between the classroom as you've done and the lab or the technical computer teacher, it seems that in the classroom where free and open source software is making progress, uh, is has really been primarily when there is a compelling financial advantage. Um, open Office, um, you know, has created uh, you know a fairly significant opportunity for schools to save money, and so decisions getting made at a district level or at a, at a school level with regard to the use of software, Open Office kind of opens the door by providing a, a very large financial benefit for its use, and then hopefully it, it has opened the door and it and it has created additional awareness about free software, open source software, because then the teacher has an opportunity to be introduced to it and to discover other tools that, that might actually work for them. But again, the, you know, the danger for the teacher is that when we ask the teacher to take responsibility for learning about and understanding the availability of and then using free software programs, you know, my sense is that for many of them, um, that's, that's, uh, number one, they may not have the time for that, and number two, they're not actually the decision makers with regard to a lot of what takes place in schools and computing. Well, I think you're right, and I think that a lot of this should be coming from, say, the school district level down. The school district is typically the place where the money is budgeted and a lot of these decisions have to be made. I mean, the rubber meets the road at the district level where, or the state level, depending upon how the funding is done. But it's at some level in the government where the government has to take a look at the future and say, what is going to be the future of our schools? And if it's done at that level, then there can be planning set aside to say, okay, we would like to see, and in the, at this time frame, some of these systems in our school turned over to something like a Linux terminal server project type of setup. And there, the savings is not only in the software licenses, but it's also saved in the administration of the systems. By having one server system and then a series of thin clients or diskless systems uh, sitting on the desktop, you help to eliminate issues around viruses, Trojan horses which are left by students on the computers that they were using, you know, whole series of problems in the classroom go away because the server system is the one 
that is protected and you know feeds the software down to the students in a in a in a partitioned off and virtualized way so there's a certain amount of economy that you get in the fact that every time the, the students leave the classroom and come back and another group comes back in, you can have them boot the machines and they come up with a fresh copy of the operating system. And, you know, so there's that type of economy. And if the district not only plans that, models that, but then has a teaching seminar during the summer to allow the teachers to do that type of work, that would be great. Likewise, when the district hands out the software to all the schools in the in the fall or in the early summer, actually, when when people start when the teachers start to come back, if they put out a disk that had both free software on it and proprietary software and said, "Here's your training tools for this year," you know what we would like you to do is, you know, still continue to use the proprietary software that you're doing but become more familiar with the free software to make it as easy as possible for the teachers to do this. The district could find out that they could, they could plan or, or, or get from the web various training courses in free software, put, put the information together, again, to make it as easy as possible for the teachers in the various schools to learn this. And the more that's done at the district level, or the state level, depending on where the funding's coming from, the easier it is down the line. And this could, this could snowball into very dramatic savings for the entire district, not just a single school. At the same time, making it easier for the teachers to teach these courses and stuff because they've had the proper training to allow them to use the software easier. Well, there's a little bit of a conundrum um, there. Because when I, when Eric Raymond and I discuss this same topic, the the difficulty you face is that there is a fairly significant financial incentive from the commercial companies to not have that happen. And you know, software and, and hardware technology is is largely marketed to schools, and so these district people will go to technology conferences and they'll and they'll participate in events that are sponsored by commercial vendors. And so there's a tremendous amount of money being spent to to convince the the decision makers of the value of the commercial software which is available for schools. And and Eric's answer was, well the schools need to become better consumers and and to make a better choice. And um very much um uh, free market solution. The difficulty, as, as two Harvard professors pointed out this summer, is that the commercial vendors um, have a first mover advantage and can and can lower the price of their software um, down significantly to avoid the adoption of free and open source software. So it does seem like there's a little, uh, a little bit of a of a difficulty there because um, you're trying to communicate the value of something without the, you know, the budget that the commercial vendors have. Well, that is true. The you know, free software, uh, by its very nature, doesn't generate huge amounts of money to do a marketing campaign. On the other hand, people have to remember where the money from the marketing campaign originally came from, which was their own pocket. These vendors are not going to these schools and pushing their software because, well, for the most part, I don't know, I can't look into the hearts of all these companies, but I'm willing to bet that most of them are not pushing their software on these schools because they really care about the schools or the school children themselves. They're pushing their software on the schools because of the philosophy and marketing that if you get people into the fold when they're young, that when they leave the school, that's going to be the time that they will be using the same software, and that's the time when you get your money back. You know, you 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 have a deferred payment plan. Uh, it's actually worse than that because I've seen many times where software companies will give companies or give software to the government and say, hey. It's for free. Go ahead and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the software for free or for very low cost. 
But what happens is that when the government starts using the software, then all of a sudden the suppliers to the government say, well, gee, we need to use the same software ourselves. And the suppliers to the government do not get the software for free. They have to pay the full price for it. And who do they charge to get back to recover that money? They charge the government. So, like W.C. Fields said, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And either you pay for it up front or you pay for it in the end. Eventually you pay for it. In the case of free software, we're saying, look, the payment for the software actually comes from the people that use it. The people that change it, the people who improve it because they need those changes, and not necessarily for the people who are just using it to solve a particular need. And we say that, you know, in the school system, rather than pay a lot of money, which will then be used for marketing to market back to you the use of those products, take your money and put it into making the changes to the software that you absolutely need to, to do better work, and then give that back to the community itself. And people have to understand that model. And yes, they are going to have to make a conscious decision. The only other thing that you can do, and, and this is one thing that I want Linux International to do, is to have a guerrilla campaign of the people who like free software to go out and talk to their legislative bodies, their school districts, to keep you know, working on them and saying, these are the reasons why you should be using free software. And I would like people to understand the fact that the only way that free software is going to get into these places is to go out and talk to your school boards and talk to your legislators and talk to your local business people and get them to understand the value of free software. And notice I didn't say the price. I said the value of free software in what they're doing. And because a lot of these people are elected and a lot of these people are up against the same problem that everybody has of having to do more stuff with less money, I think that free software would win in that case. Well, if I could wave a magic wand, uh, I wish we had a visible champion for free software or open source software like Mark Shuttleworth in South Africa. Because the, you know, part of what I think um, ends up happening is that um, if, if I'm at a school, if I'm on a school board or if I'm at a district level, then it's very hard for me to make a decision that is proactive and different than, than has been made before. And I noticed that adoption of, say, the Linux Thin Client Labs takes place largely by committed individuals who have some freedom to make decision in their own lab or at their own school. And, and they do have a little bit of autonomy and they have, and they're focused on computing and so they can, uh, they, they can learn about the technology and they can implement it. But, but largely they don't get support from their districts because it is something different and unknown. And it occurs to me that, um, you know, there, if we had some visible body or individual who was championing free software, that that in a free market economy, that might help in a lot of ways to provide some drive or incentive for people to, to learn about it and to feel comfortable that this is something that's not just being brought to them by a local parent, but actually has a much more national presence. Well, first of all, I find it hard to believe that in this day and age, in the year 2006, that the various districts out there uh, have not heard of free software and don't have a relatively good idea of what it is and the fact that it is creeping out into the industry. And if anybody approached a district uh, educational board and didn't bring along like a whole raft 
of various places that free software has been used and used successfully, well then, <laughs> they shouldn't even be going to the school board in the first place. So the concept that you know this is just something that's being brought to them by an individual parent or an individual teacher and there's nothing that's out there, that might have been true in, say, 1994, but it's not true today, I don't believe. The second thing, uh, I found it interesting that you said a champion like Mark Shuttleworth. And what you really meant was a champion like Mark Shuttleworth who made $500 million with free software. And that he's using some of this software to drive the Ubuntu project and the other projects uh, basically in a commercial venture because there is Canonical and I believe that Mark is expecting to make money off Canonical and there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, there's lots of champions of free software out there who don't have $500 million and who have who do have a lot of experience with education and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know what Mark's uh, background in education is, but I'm not even sure that he has a, a master's degree in anything. Not that he doesn't deserve one from his life experiences. But you know, there's lots of people out there who have been driving it forth. And I attend a, a training session every year called NELS, which is put on by a person called David Trask. He's one of those individuals who had maybe a certain amount of freedom in his school and in his district. And he keeps expanding that outward by inviting more and more people to this training session who bring along their own uh, stories of successes and things like that in mostly what we call in the Northeast charter schools. And then from those charter schools, the district is seeing more and more successes that keep spawning out into individual schools. So I think that there are lots of champions in, in the free software space. And there's lots of people who have made significant money. So if you want to take a look at pointing at people who have made significant money, you can take a look at Robert Young of Red Hat. Or you could take a look at Larry Augustin of VA Linux Systems. Or you could take a look at any of the any of the three guys who started Red Hat or various people who started various companies. They all made significant amounts of money. Most of them are still actively uh you know, promoting either free software or concepts around free software, such as Lulu, uh, a publishing company that Bob Young started, which allows people to publish books on demand, which allows books to be printed that otherwise would never get, never see the light of day. So, like, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think the distinction for me would be, that, you know, that Mark's uh, foundation has actually, um, in a, you know, in, in addition to his, his work with Ubuntu and an obvious commercial interest. He's also funneled money into the foundation to provide uh, Linux Thin Client in you know 100 to 200 schools that are that are very underprivileged. And I know that after the hurricanes Katrina and Rita, I spent a lot of time on the phone with um, district level and even state level people trying to provide some opportunity to um, for free use donated computers to implement Linux Thin Client in schools that were just devastated. And in fact, even before the hurricanes did not have adequate computing technology. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, I, I, w I wish I could agree with you with regard to our current day and age and, and district level understanding of free and open source software and the decision making. But those schools in the Gulf Coast and, and even school districts local to me that are having tremendous financial difficulties, the political barriers to even looking at Linux and client as a solution are huge. And and I think, you know, part of what I'm hearing you say, and I think it's accurate, is that given time, there will be an increased understanding and awareness of these solutions, and, and they, I think, will naturally take effect. At the same time, I think there are some political realities at play here. Um, 
You know, it's it's not uncommon for um, a, a school district that is financially strapped and is and and does begin to look at alternative solutions to discover that uh, a commercial vendor um, gives them a gift to keep them using the commercial software. And oh yes, and a lot of those decisions, are, you know, um, are are made at a level which which really isn't taking into account the full benefits of of the free and open source software movement. Absolutely, and I'm also aware of various times that people in the school board, um, they have a member that works for a proprietary software company or the brother of somebody on the school board works for a, you know, or, or sells software for a proprietary company and they see a threat of free and open source software coming into their schools. And so they will turn around and, like you say, they will make a, a gift of some software to these schools. But, w again, what these schools have to look forward to or have to, have to think about is, how long will this gift work? Will, they, will, will this person who is giving them this gift of supposedly free software, or I should say software without cost. This software without cost, are they willing to guarantee that for the next 20 years they'll be able to get upgrades to this software without cost? Are they going to guarantee that they would be able to, you know, what is, what is the lifetime of the computer systems that they're going to be putting this software on? And, you know, do they have any control over that? Or are, at a certain period of time, are those computer systems basically going to be the junk, like I saw in the office at Sohiken, that they can't use any of the proprietary software on it, and they're going to have to buy new hardware because that's what the software works on? I know that I've had um, repeated experiences with schools who were cash-strapped, who discovered... Linux Think client and implemented it and, and had an internal champion who was very excited about it where the school felt a huge benefit and a sense of relief that they could actually provide basic stable computing at, at a very inexpensive cost and then a year or two later um, somebody comes up with fifty or a hundred thousand dollars for computing and against the wishes of the champion the the board dismantles the LTSP lab and installs a traditional Windows environment. And I'm, I'm just trying to brainstorm, trying to figure out, you know, based on your experience and mine, uh, w you know, what can we do that would, that would actually make a difference here? Well, one thing that can be done is most school boards and most uh, universities have a industry uh, advisory board and I know that back at Hartford State Technical College we had one where people from industry said this is where we see people going in the future and this is where we are going to be needing people trained in the future this is the way that we think you should be going and a lot of these companies are now integrating Linux into their own shops. If they do not have people who can utilize free software and and know what it is and how to integrate it, then they're going to be having problems in the future with finding the trained people that they need to work with free software with Linux and other pieces of free software. So one of the things that might help is to get the input of these people and the entire board of where the school board should be going. And therefore, you know, not allow it only to be this kind of flip-flopping back and forth on the school board of whether or not they should implement a piece of, of proprietary software this year because they happen to get it for free or they get a grant of a hundred thousand dollars where nine hundred or ninety nine thousand of that is in software licenses and maybe one thousand dollars is an actual benefit to say no 
you know, that's not a good deal. Because if we if we utilize this so called gift right now, that means that we're not gonna have we're gonna have to pay for it in the future. I mean any company, any for profit company has to make a profit. And sooner or later the people that are that receive that gift have to pay for it. There is just no way else of looking at it. And so they have to make a decision about what they're going to do for the good of their community. One of the one of the things I point out with free software is that when people find out how software works and they can see how software works, they can generate more local jobs for people, not only in installing package software, because that work will still have to be done, but also in changing the software to meet the needs of the end user customers. You can't do that today with proprietary software because you need the source code from the vendor itself. With free software, you can actually go out and change that code. So it requires a higher level of skill from the people in the community, which should, should demand higher wages. So instead of us sending all of that money to specified groups such as Redmond, Washington, we tend to keep it in our own local community where we have local software people who buy local food local housing, and pay local taxes. Now, I don't know how much maple syrup Bill Gates buys every year, because maple syrup is something we, we generate here in New Hampshire. But I'm willing to bet he doesn't buy as much maple syrup as we buy software from him. And consequently, there is a cash flow out of New Hampshire to Redmond, Washington, that isn't balanced off. And I'd like to keep some of that money here in my own little state to finance my own software community. And that's something the school board has to think about. Well, I think those are really great points. And, and I'd like to, to uh, for, for closing here, for closing purposes, I'd like to go back a little bit to a vision that you communicated that I think is also really compelling. And that's the idea that as we become increasingly collaborative as a society, as the effects of the internet and free and open source software and the newer web technologies are making a significant impact, you know, I, I can see just a, a wonderful benefit from um, students in high school working on free and open source software projects that actually benefit their local community, helping to build a database for the local homeless shelter, um, you know, creating uh, some kind of a system for the um, you know, the City Parks and Recs Division. It, you know, it seems to me that there's a huge opportunity to use free and open source software to build on this uh, ability to collaborate that, that the Internet uh, has, has brought to us. And I think that uh, I would, I'm anxious for us to find ways to continue to spread that message and to help people realize and recognize the benefits of free and open source software in that way. One thing, one thing we didn't talk about are some of the kids that I have seen who have done what I consider to be just absolutely amazing stuff. A kid who at the age of 14 put out his own distribution called the Fat Linux distribution. It's one of the first ones to install into the Fat file system so you didn't have to repartition your disk. And he did this basically by himself. I think he had help from another 14-year-old that they never met face-to-face. -face. They only worked over the Internet. Um, now he's going to Ohio State University. He's about ready to graduate degree in computer engineering. He said, hey, you know, I want to learn something about the hardware because anything in the software I can teach myself. Or a kid who lived about three miles from my house who started programming at the age of nine by the age of 12, he was hacking the Linux kernel. By the age of 15, he was writing device drivers. At the age of 19, he was a senior systems administrator for a small college in Massachusetts. At the age of 21, he was helping the American FBI capture people breaking into computer systems from Italy by creating a honeypot on his school system. 
And now he's helping the guy who did the original uh, work for Star Wars develop a new set of 3D glasses. Um, you know, just Mark Spencer, the guy who started the Asterisk Project. At the age of 19, he started Asterisk, and now at 26, he has his own company where he, owns, he employs all these people and supplies stuff for people, you know, worldwide. People are making money off of his open source project. And the reason I bring these up is because each one of these kids had something in common. In the fact that it was their own drive, and they had all of this source code available to them, and there was nobody sitting there telling them, oh, you can't go here, you can't look at this, you can't use the software in that way, oh, you can't do that, oh, you can't do that. And that's what I think our kids should be exposed to. At least those uh, who have an interest in computer in computing, science. Sure. But why not other things? Take a look at take a look at YouTube. You know, take a look at Creative Commons. It's not necessarily tied to computers. The computer is a tool that makes this a lot easier. The internet's a tool that makes this a lot easier. It's the openness of people willing to share both what they've done and what their thoughts are. And that, I mean, when this kid, three miles from my house, sent an email message to me, said, hi, I'm interested in Linux, I live close to you, would you mind going out for pizza? I didn't turn him down, you know. I said, sure, you know, let's meet for pizza. We met with Pets Pizza. We, we became good friends, and I kept track of him over time. You know, now he's, he's married and has a wife out in Oregon, but, you know, it's the willingness to share and to be a mentor and all the things that go along with teaching. That, that is actually what free software is about. It's really not about the software. The the uh, I'll tell you another area I think is is comparable to that uh, that that excites me, and it's not related to free software, but but uh, is related to collaborative participation. Uh, is in uh, history because the wikis provide an opportunity for students to research specific historical topics and to become. Uh, an expert in a particular area, and especially in family history. So, you know, I may, you know, I may have the letters of my grandfather when he was in World War One, and and I can actually write his life story, and I become the expert on my grandfather. Yeah. And 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 as I'm doing that, I'm actually a historian. Yeah. And and I think there are huge opportunities uh, in in a variety of fields for true contributions and for the the learning that comes from contributing. There's there's another thing. When I was teaching at Harper State uh, many years ago, I ran into a frustration that I had of trying to teach students how to program from the very beginning because at that time most of the students didn't have. Uh, computer in their homes. They didn't have a computer in the high school. The first time they saw computers when they came to my lab in college. And I was frustrated because I'd have them sit down and start to write these simple programs. And you could see that what they really wanted to do was they wanted to write some type of computer game or they wanted to write something of significance. And I was just starting them off, you know, doing stuff like Hello World, you know, basically a, a, a seven-line program. And I, was, I ran into frustrations because working by themselves, it was very difficult for them to write any type of significant program. Now, if I was teaching today, besides teaching them, again, how to start off and how to write these programs, I might ask them to take a look at significant programs that have been written by people who are, I consider to be very good programmers and to go in and change those programs and make them better so that they would actually get a feeling of accomplishment that they had done something and that they were, they were going in, looking at other people's code, seeing good coding methods, 
but they would do something that would immediately be useful by tens of thousands of other people. And that has got to give them a good feeling of accomplishment, even if they don't do the entire project by themselves. This leads me, by the way, into something which will probably make me very unpopular with lots of people, the whole concept of software patents. Um, when I started off in college, I was very definitely a Democrat. And then the first time I paid my income tax, I very definitely became a Republican. And after that, I've been a Republican for a long time, but I'm tending to sweep back towards democracy again, Democrat. And when people ask me about software patents, first of all, I point out that software patents didn't even exist until very late in the entire computer science history. I believe it was 1986 when the first software patent was uh, done. It could have been 96, I can't remember, but it was relatively late. And a lot of things in computer science had already been created, such as compilers and microcode and subroutines, lots of concepts that nobody ever patented because there wasn't such a thing as a software patent. And the, the industry moved forward very quickly. The concept that we need software patents to create innovation is simply not borne out by fact. And the fact, and, and, and people who say that innovation only comes from proprietary companies, in addition, that has not been borne out by fact. And I'd like to give the illustration of how difficult software patents are by having people think about two areas where patents do not exist the area of painting and of music. In painting, let's imagine Michelangelo sitting on his back, painting the Sistine Chapel, year after year of painting, painting, painting. And he just about gets finished, and in comes his arch enemy, Da Vinci. And he looks up, and he goes, oh, beautiful painting. But you have to start all over again because last week I patented that brushstroke. Or Beethoven with his symphonies. And he gets all the way finished and the crowd is applauding behind him. He can't hear them because he's deaf. And in from the side comes his arch enemy Handel and says, beautiful symphony maestro. But you have to start over again because last week I patented the triplet. Software, when I started programming, you could count the number of computer systems in the entire world in probably the low thousands. And the people who worked on them were in the low tens of thousands. They talked with each other. Many of them knew each other. And software was... In the, in the area where the machines cost millions of dollars to buy. And yet, software moved forward without software patents. Today, anybody can write a program. And a significant computer system to write a significant program can cost you $200 or less. And software is every place. Software is in everything. It is, it is every place. It's in light switches, it's in TVs, it's in radios, it's every place. And so if we, as a society, say that protecting intellectual property as a man-made law, in order that society moves forward faster, if that is the goal, then I believe that the age of software patents, if it ever existed, is over with and that we are actually making it harder for people to write software and come up and distribute good ideas with soft, by, by having and employing software patents than we would ever be able to recover. And I, you know, so as a natural law, as, as a man-made law, not a natural law, you know, a natural law is where it drops something and it falls to the ground because there's gravity. 
We can't do much about that. But as a man-made law, we can make a decision as a society and as a world that software patents are over with and we are going to disassemble them and we are going to move back. We are certainly not going to grant any more software patents. And I urge people to understand and think about this and to say to their legislators, we believe that software patents are harming the, the forward movement of software and that we would like to disassemble them. I think that's a great note to end on. Mad Dog, I really appreciate your time. Thanks sure. for, for joining me.